Greetings, friends and family, and welcome to another episode of the DJP. Okay, so check this out. If you haven't figured this out by now, I really enjoy having conversations with interesting people. And my guest today is absolutely no exception to this rule. Uh, Mark Weissman is a modern day Uf Hefner. And if you don't know what that is, well, neither did I. And unfortunately, I'm not going to tell you because I'm going to force you to listen to the episode. Uh, Mark worked as a minister with the Christian church for a long time, and he's studied extensively throughout the world. He kind of came to his spirituality through a, a process, and he's got uh, like a lot, he's got several degrees. He's developed successful methods of dealing with PTSD and helping veterans for the most part, but not just veterans, people. He's helped people build coping mechanisms to get back to their lives. His primary mission is to help friends and family overcome their obstacles. And, you know, that's a message that's really close to home for me because that's what I'm trying to do, too. And you guys are just that, my friends and my family. And I love you guys. So we'll go ahead and get this thing rolling. Without further ado, Mark Weissman. You might catch yourself sliding in and out of the You might catch yourself sliding in and out of the Just relax and enjoy it. Just relax and enjoy it. This is an experiment, is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, and your mind and your brain. We're using digital We're using techniques, digital techniques to, overload, to overload, scramble, scramble, confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind, your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, Chaos is beautiful. Yeah, how are you, Mark? I am doing outstanding. How are you? I am, for the most part, okay. No, good. No. That's a good start. Yeah, indeed. No complaints. No complaints. Yeah, you want to give me a little background on on what you do? And <clears throat> uh, well, ultimately, for a living. Uh, I'm actually a computer programmer by day mm -hmm. and a spiritual counselor uh, for the rest of my life, uh, which involves late nights, uh, pretty much seven nights a week. Uh, I do spiritual counseling for returning veterans, primarily mm -hmm. uh, returning from combat. But um, I have done uh, it, it's moved beyond just spiritual counseling. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I work with sport groups and the, and their kids and um, all of the members themselves. Now I'm actually branching out and working with folks who are struggling with obviously the depression that comes along with lockdowns and prolonged pandemics right. and other uh, trauma. Uh, primarily, I work with traumatic uh, psychology issues, helping yeah. folks kind of put the pieces back into a puzzle that they can then operate from. Right on. That's awesome. Um, How did you get involved? Yeah. And then, well, actually it's a funny story. Uh, I was actually a, a Christian pastor. Um, oh, huh. I was ordained back in 2002 and you know, you uh, part of being a chaplain is I went around and I, I did a lot of care and whatnot. And, and I'm a veteran myself. So I know the struggles and so I started working with folks in the congregation. Mm -hmm. One thing begat another. Um, and it's during that time that I discovered my own heathen roots uh, back in, in, in Denmark and began to really expand upon that, uh, that knowledge and that history. A uh, lot of, of uh, family uh, brought to me information and, and I really began to study it and really uh, embraced uh, heathenism, uh, left the church, and then um, started to teach people more or less the way my ancestors would have done it. It's trying to, uh, taking the KISS principle to a, a whole new level okay. of trying to apply simplicity in their lives and actually build plans to put one foot in front of the other and, and get successful. And of course, 
uh, one thing led to another. And now I run, uh, I have about 60 hours a week doing counseling plus a 40 hour week at work. <laughs> so uh, a lot of it. Sounds like you're a pretty busy guy. <laughs> I keep myself entertained. Uh, yeah, I feel that. Same here. Same here. I, I'm probably busier than I should be for my own health, but you know, I, I think if you can, as long as you can balance it out, right, then you're, you're okay. But you know, it can be right. difficult to find that balance. It is. So let's talk. So what is the name of, uh, okay. You said you kind of started delving a little bit into like your culture's way of handling this. Let's, let's, let's work on that. Let's expand okay. on that because as of right now, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Um, I am an 18th generation Germanic Dane. Mm -hmm. uh, I have 18 generations of family lineage that goes back into Northern Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, research to point, and I'm sure as we dig more, we're going to get even further back. But one of the things that I discovered upon doing this ancestral research was the fact that uh, we talk about roughly the just after the age of the Vikings, which everyone, of course, is familiar with. And, and of course, the, the pantheon and the religion that came with that. But one of the things that is usually overlooked when folks talk about the Norse mm -hmm. and the Danes, particularly, is the simplicity of their lives. Okay. They, did, they didn't have all the, the turmoil that we have. Well, firstly and foremost, they lived on a very honorable code. Mm -hmm. And um, the Danes kind of built, uh, they were called the nine noble virtues. And these nine noble virtues were uh, essentially the cornerstone attributes that you're going to hear over and over again throughout history mm -hmm. because the Knights of the Round Table or that, that whole era of folks would adopt them. And we see them all the way into special forces today. These, this was the code of conduct that was developed way back um, in, uh, actually, it was pre-Viking mm -hmm. days um, of how folks lived their life. They lived it honorably. They lived it. They were self-reliant. They kept more of the work on them, less of the work on depending on other people. So they were, they were much more self-reliant. Although they were hospitable and they were willing to certainly give um, help and shelter and, and the things that were needed, mm. it was kind of looked upon in a very different way than we hear today, where um, we hear a lot of, of, of talk about the social nightmare that has kind of changed the, the paradigm from a hand up to a hand out, right? And so um, I talk about with mental issues, we turn it back and we say, all right, I'm going to give you a hand up, mm. but then you're expected to do the work. You're expected to uh, understand you're going to carve all this drama out of your life mm. and you're just going to start simple and you're going to start taking steps towards uh, a recovery. And most of the time I work with, with gentlemen and ladies um, who have had very traumatic uh, uh, and they trigger very quickly. And so one of the, the biggest things I, I talk about is breaking it all down and saying, all right, there are four steps to getting through to the next footstep. And that is to stop, obviously, before you do anything, just stop, take a breath, breathe. Mm -hmm. think and then act. And so we, we go through that and we, we almost make it their mantra. And so very simplistic, four steps, stop, breathe, think, act. And by, by minimizing how society is going to accept that, removing the stigmas around it, removing the stereotypes around it, Mm. Removing all that false pride and all that uh, bravado yeah. Yeah, the ego. that we find, right? And we find that is is very prominent. Particularly, uh, a lot of the gentlemen and ladies that I work with are 
what they call operators. So okay. I call them high energy folk. Uh. <laughs> and, and so these are the special forces and, and the like who right. come back and they are with very good reason. I mean, they're proud of themselves and, and I'm very proud of their accomplishments, but they got to put that aside and fix them. Yeah. And so we find one of the things that I discovered in, in my professional career as I was going through as a chaplain is I discovered that in my own life, mm -hmm. this really came to fruition in one of the earlier sessions where it dawned on me the influence, whether we wanted to or not, the influence that monotheistic practices had had, particularly given where you come from, right? So if you, as an example, if you grew up your whole life in San Francisco, as an example, you're a little bit more freer. You understand that there's, yeah, the rules are yeah, semi-flexible. Right. Society, yeah, it's kind of a... But if you're born and raised in the Bible Belt, that's not an option. Right. Well, yeah. I was born good, in, bad. in the Bible Belt, so... <laughs> yeah, so good, bad, right, wrong, uh, good versus evil, that whole paradigm oh. is embedded in people from before they're born. Oh yeah. I sure. mean, really, you know, as, as mom and dads are talking about how they're going to raise their kids and the, and, and, you know, granted they may not be able to understand the language just yet, but right. ultimately they're getting this vibe that says, Oh, well that's evil. And Oh, that's good. Don't and, do that. Or you're going to go oh, to hell. Right. Wow. Right. And, and so those, those stigmas, are attached. And what happens is, and I find in my practices that a lot of people could s store those little nuggets. They continue to kind of bravado their way through it, but they've stored that little nugget that uh, I call it a little nugget of guilt. Mm. And what happens is those build up over a period of a lifetime. Right. And then what happens is now realistically you're going into and I, i'll use one of the examples you're going into a combat zone huh. uh where bad things are most likely going to happen hmm. but you've only got half the capacity to process that now right because you you've buried half of it under this guilt or shame that you're yes you've looked past but it's still there and so yeah. then when this trauma hits you it may not even be a big trauma it may be something that you know, happened way over there and it wasn't even really close to you, mm. but because you're only processing with half the power, you overwhelm the brain. The right. brain is only capable of so much. It only has so much bandwidth. So you wind up breaking. And so what we have to do in those kinds of sessions is go in and say, all right, let's look at those nuggets. Let's pull them out. Cause we know the big things there. It's not going away anytime soon. Right. It's, it's in your mind. And, and rightfully so, it's a very traumatic experience. But ultimately, we got to pull these nuggets out. And as we pull those nuggets out, we're going to find that that big thing kind of shifts down into the psyche, keeps coming down. Kind of, and then ultimately, we wind up with some headspace up at the top right. where we can get some cognizant thought and start thinking about, okay, how can we deal with this, hmm. this issue, this this big trauma and start building these baby steps that we can take to kind of move past it and, it, you know, enjoy life and have a happy life. Yeah. And then getting the support folk, uh, wives, uh, girlfriends, moms, dads, mm. kids, whoever their support network, get them to understand what it looks like when this is going to happen. So that instead of them potentially adding more guilt nuggets, mm. <laughs> they can kind of go, all right, I'm going to shut up because I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to add to that nugget. And I'm going to let him or her process this, do you know his little agreed upon steps, and then we're going to move past this. And then eventually it gets easier for this, the, the servicemen to get past that. And, and so these tricks that we've given him now these coping mechanisms is what i call it the coping mechanisms then come into play they become more second nature right and so yes the helicopter still triggers me but 
know now it's not a paralyzing fear. I know, hey, I'm in civilian. I'm here with my wife and my kids in the park. Right. This is not a chopper coming in that's going to do damage. I process through. And and so that's that's kind of the idea. But simplifying that so that folks can get rid of all that stigma, all that lack of a better phrase, nonsense, and and actually be able to process and move through life. Right. And so that's kind of that's my whole principle as to how um, getting those folks to move forward. So what, what do you do as like, what do you teach as far as processing techniques? Like what, what are some of the techniques that you use uh, to help these uh, young men and women or even older well, the, men and women process these traumatic events? Well, the, the first thing is we have to, we have to identify where you're coming from, from a baseline, mm. right? We have to figure out where that, as I mentioned, We've got that that lower stack of nuggets and shame yeah. that's buried down in there. So we got to kind of figure where those are and say, okay, all right. So I, I want you to just hold that, and then we're going to use you know this stop breathe mechanism. Mm. So it's we're going to tattoo it on their hand, almost put a post it on their forehead, whatever it takes right. to get them to just stop and breathe. Mm. And yes, that's still going to be there, but we're going to figure it out. But first, we got to give ourselves some headspace. And so we've got to identify what else is going on processing in the brain to kind of clear that stuff out. Mm. And then that gives us headspace now to where the individual can actually think. They can put their own plans together. They don't right. technically okay. need me. It, you know, and so that's kind of the idea of where we go, where we, how we start it and how we get it get going. It sounds a lot like. Uh, vipassana meditation and mindfulness. I, uh, you know, I, I I teach all of my all of my patients. Uh, all of them are told meditation is without a doubt the best way to first to identify those nuggets. Yep. I mean, because that kind of helps you to say, all right, what is in my brain? What is in them? What's floating around in there? Right. And so. That's the, that's the elemental key that we're going to search for in meditation. But then one of the other things that meditation also allows is sometimes it allows for the expansion of processing. We're going to use that second processor, I guess. I'm not sure how it all works out really, but ultimately what it gives us is that little extra space to just kind of wrap our arms around that big dragon and say, all right, this is how big he is. And so what else do we got? How can I get him through the door, so to speak, right. um, and get him on his way? And so meditation is one of the best ways. And I, I teach it, uh, or I, I tell them to if find folks, because uh, there's all kinds of people out there, uh, yeah. particularly uh, in the Eastern practice who are, just masters at meditation. Right. Whereas, I mean, I'm good for me. Mm -hmm. I, I do my own meditation <laughs> and, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to teach it to somebody else. Right. Um, you know, right. I can, I can tell you, Hey, you know, this is what I do and uh, this is how I do it. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a 50 plus year old guy who's, <laughs> you know, so my process is going to be very different. So I do try to get them with folks who are, more knowledgeable in me uh, to get them into some serious meditation. So I do find that works best. Right on. Yeah. There's a lot of really good meditation teachers out there too. A lot of really yes, good there are. teachers out there. I am fortunate Agreed. to know uh, quite a few of them myself. And uh, oh. yeah, no, I, I, med I meditate daily. It's been a practice I've maintained for a while now. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, I mean, just for, you know, helping to identify the problems that I'm having, or, you know, where they stem from, uh, how to, how to, you know, how to fix them, you know, the best way to go about doing that, you know, the best way to even going about approaching, you know, it's just all about that deep introspection and investigation, really. And exactly. Yeah. And yeah. And, and meditation is the best tool for that. I mean, absolutely. There's really nothing, Hands down. really nothing better. <laughs> Hands down. Yep. Hands down. You know, anytime anybody comes to me and they're like, Hey, I'm going to having these problems in my life. If I'm like, have you tried meditating? And they're like, no, how's that going to help? I'm like, well, just, you know, give it 30 minutes a day for a month and see what happens. You know? Yeah. Generally, if they do, they're like, yeah, that really helped. 
So yeah, I know. Yeah, dude. I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. It's 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 amazing what you can get out of meditation. Mm. Um and and I I I will swear by it um till the cows come home. Um and I encourage everyone, even even the younger folk who come to my office and are like, oh, you know, they're either a support member or I've had some uh, uh, traumatic uh, kids who have seen some crazy stuff. So um, I we meet and we talk and I say, all right, I'm going to I'm going to tell you this is what you're going to do. And it's going to sound a little crazy because you're 15 and you don't want to slow down long enough. Right. But here's the best way for you to start making your own inroads without needing me. So you never have to come, come here again. You can start fixing this yourself, um, but you got to give yourself a chance. And yeah, so exactly. You got to be willing yeah. to do the work. And that's the big thing is that, you know, having is. the willingness to want to do the work and, and, you know, having faith that it's going to help, you know, cause it can be really hard to get started on, on a journey of healing and recovery from trauma, uh, it can be difficult. You know, like a lot of people just are, are really scared to even look at that part of themselves because it's, you know, it can be scary. It can be, especially, you know, if you're meditating, like good luck. <laughs> it seems, you know, yeah, and, and, and I realized that it, it, it makes you feel almost vulnerable again. Mm -hmm. So for those folks who have been involved in a trauma, you know, we, we have to take those in small steps, right? Because we know, hey, look, this person, uh, your support network or somebody is going to be right there. You're, you're safe, you know, and getting that point across so that they can actually get some benefit out of the meditation. Um, that's, that's key because you are very vulnerable while you're in meditation. So yeah, that, that's accurate. I, uh, I help facilitate. I help facilitate a, uh, like a Buddhist recovery group here, uh, where I'm at, I'm at. And, uh, I was leading a meditation the other night and I had two people get up and, uh, and leave in the middle of it. And, uh, no, yeah, I mean, that just speaks volumes to, you know, the power of meditation. And if you've had deep trauma, then you may not be ready for, you know, what you're, right. you know, what, what's going to come yeah. up. Yeah. And that's, that's definitely, that's definitely a, the case when we talk about, you know, meditation and, and, deep meditation where you are starting to poke at those things that are down underneath the trauma mm. um, that can get really touchy. And for those individuals who are still carrying around that, that pride and that ego, they've got to get through that to get to right. some of those nuggets underneath. And for, for many, that's that in of itself is the most complicated journey they'll take. Yeah, just, just getting letting, through that. Yeah, letting go of that pride and that ego. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's probably the biggest part is the humility yeah. to go. Okay, yeah, I I have some things I need to work on. I'm maybe yeah. not, maybe I'm not perfect, right? And maybe I'm not broken too. There's a lot of people who think they're just too broken to be you yeah know, to, to be helped, and that's not the case either. Like nobody is nobody's broken. You know, you no. you may have some trauma. But that can be navigated. That can be worked through. You just haven't approached it from the the proper perspective and the proper angle to be able to work through it yet. Yep. But, but everybody yep. is ca capable of getting back to a. I don't. I don't really like the word recover because like recover what you know like. Yeah. We gotta. You know. We don't even know what we're recovering at this point. But yeah. Just <laughs> just, just just getting better. You know. It's just yeah. Like, oh, well, getting to a happy place is the way I kind of put it. Because just, not even happy, man. Just just content. Well, yes, if you're, if you're and maybe shooting, that's if you're shooting for happy. If you're shooting for happy, you, a lot of times you're going to fall flat. You know what I mean? Like if that's your yeah, goal, well, if your goal is true. like joy and elation, you're probably going to be let down, and then you're going to get depressed. Well, yeah, a little bit. So, like as long as you're just good where you're at, like you know, being content in the present content, moment, I like that. Just the way it is, you know, like yep. really just being okay with, you know, right now things are perfect. They may not be exactly where I want to be, but they're perfect. You know, right. And they are can, where I can operate from. Right. And that's a hard place for people to get to. Um, that, that equanimous position is, is definitely difficult. I struggled with that for the longest time. And it's only like really re pretty recently, you know, in the past year or two that I've really gotten to a place where it's like, you know, I'm, I sure I have desire to, you know, accomplish more and do more things with my life. But at the moment, I'm perfectly content with where I'm at, you know, 
And it's a good place to it's be. A it's place. a nice place. It's a nice place to live yes, at. It man. Is. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it I, is. I've and lived it, some and of those other certainly places. Be, yeah, exactly. That's exactly where I was going. Yeah. In, in lieu of the, the trade off, which was the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. This is a great place to be. Yeah, exactly. And like, not to say that I don't still have uh, many moments of like, you know, um, really intense joy and uh, extreme happiness because I do. You know, I have a, uh, Lots of things in my life that are, are make me very happy, but as long as I'm content, I'm okay. You know, so that's that's me. Yeah, <laughs> e- e- even field. Yeah, man. Just a yeah, just a baseline. I don't need to be high. I don't. I don't need. I don't want to be low. I'm just just keep me right in the middle. Walking that middle yep. path. Man. <laughs> there you, you go. Know, that's there about you go. the best place to be, really. You know, like I said, if you're if you're constantly shooting for high, you're going to be let down a lot. You know, like having high expectations or really any expectations are going to mm. We gotta mess you up a lot of the time. Well, yeah, you know, and and I think you know when I when I talk to you, a lot of the folks that I work with on on, on a day by day basis, it's mm. it's I want you, I want you, and and I'm I'm pointing at their chest and saying I want you to shoot for this, mm. but understand it's okay to be here. Mm. So yeah. I want yeah. you to shoot for the moon. Oh yeah, yeah. If, I mean, if you reach the altitude, go, go for the, or goal. the yeah. The, yeah. And if you reach the atmosphere, that's great. But you know what? If you're above ground, yeah. yay, yeah, yay. I mean, even even if you you know even if you shoot for the moon and you crash and burn, you know you 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 can figure out the the flaws in the plan and the maybe yeah. the execution, and then shoot again. You know, go for it again. I mean, you, exactly. failure is going to be a part of you know the recovery process. You know, that's going to come up a lot. That feeling of like, oh, I should be further along than I am. Uh, it's, you know, um, I feel like a failure. I think, you know, I went for the thing and I didn't get the thing. It's like, yeah, well, now you've, you know, figured out the weaknesses in your approach. So next time, you know, don't make those same mistakes. Try a new approach. You Learn. can't keep doing the Learn same. Learn and grow. Yeah. You can't keep doing the same things and expect a different result. We all know what that is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good, man. Yeah, for sure. Like I said, meditation helps so many people. I'm glad to see that, you know, it is helping people in, in, in your line of, uh, treatment as well. That's great. And do you have any other techniques, uh, that you use? I mean, besides, uh, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, in some of the cases, uh, a lot of folks have come to me and, and because I am outside of the Christian faith, mm. um, I, I have a little bit more. I would say freedom, if you will, with uh, kind of spiritual and uh, spiritual understandings mm. that for those interested folks and only the people who, who want to go there, I make sure that they lead the way. But um, once that door is open, then we can talk about what are the spiritual influences, our lives, you know, are these the best choices mm. and kind of build plans um, based on what, where they see themselves. Right on. So, um, folks who have, um, you know, I, I worked with a, a gentleman who found out in, in, during one of our sessions, he found out that he was like a third or a quarter percent, uh, indigenous native, uh, American. <laughs> and I said, man, what a beautiful culture to embrace. Right. What a beautiful culture to embrace. And, and so we talked and, and of course I have friends in all damn near every culture. Right. So I, I spoke with some friends of mine. I said, you know, this guy needs, needs some contact and, and they hooked him up and, and, uh, uh, he began the spiritual in depth, spiritual, uh, awakening. Uh, and it was, he had a great time, but I, because I'm not, um, really associated with any recognized uh religious practice mm. uh i i have a lot more freedom to open up people's eyes to to maybe embracing their culture and maybe looking at the the practices of those cultures and saying hey b- maybe part of where this these underlying problems stemmed from was me being dragged over to this other thing i'll call it monotheism but Mm. you can put any name you want on it right and maybe it was that that 
started my uh, higher level of anxiety where by the time this traumatic event hit, uh, I was already, you know, my bandwidth was already half done. Mm. So now I've got to try to figure out, but now if I can address those nuggets with, through my culture and my study of my spiritual health, Mm. um, we can, we can go down that road too. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing when that happens. What are, what are your spiritual views exactly? My spirituality, uh, <laughs> that's a really great question. I love it. Um, I am actually, by definition, if you ask anybody else, they'll call me a Norse heathen. Mm. Um, but what I study is I'm actually a, a, a studier of spiritual influences. Oh. So I talk about the Lenvedi of the Norse. Uh, the yokai of the Japanese, the great spirits of the indigenous Americas, voodoo or vodao mm. from uh, West Africa, which obviously everyone knows migrated to Haiti and then up to the United States. I've studied the spirits of uh, the spiritual worship in uh, uh, the Aztec and the, and the Mayan cultures, how they embraced it. Mm. Um, so I really study, I'm, I guess if you, really broke it down i would probably say i'm an animist which Mm. is the study of spirits all Mm. around us okay but uh i kind of i do believe uh i was i'm a sworn uv hefnar by by blood oath to what is is that uv hefnar Mm -hmm. and uv hefnar as i've come to learn uh i'm about four years into this now um uh, Uv Hefnar, they were the special forces of, well, long before Norway, but they helped unify Norway uh, mm. when those times. But they were shaman warriors of the Norse mm. uh, of the time. They actually stemmed from uh, a, another group called the Lombards uh, in the Germanic tribes that were technically north of of the Romans and the, the Celtic Celtic were over in Gaul, but the Lombards kind of were in Northern Germany there and became what we know today as the Danes, uh, who obviously uh, kind of ruled Scandinavia for most of its life. Right. Um, and then, um, and so the Uf Hefnars were, um, they connected the Lanvedi, which are the spirits of the land mm. in old Norse, and they connected the the, the Lanvedi um, to themselves so that they could be used in combat. So uh, instead of having to fight a force of 10,000, uh, a flood could wipe out the whole army. And so they could they could employ the Lanvedi to uh, affect the weather or they could pass disease. Um, and that would help whoever the Uvhethnars were fighting for at the time would help them obviously win. Um, probably one of the more popular names you're going to hear when it comes to Uf Hefnar was our brother. And those are the berserkers of uh, Norse mythology. Okay. Okay. The berserkers represented the bear. Uf Hefnars represented the wolf. Um, they were more cunning and they were more spiritual. Whereas the bear is just total brute force, mm. tear down the walls and um, go forth. Um, and so both of them were, were they were considered shapeshifters in their day. Um, I consider that to be more camouflage, where half your body looks like it's something else, but it's it's really still there. Um, but because of you know the the age and the, the timing, they were referred to as shapeshifters. Hmm. Uh, but again, I took the shaman side of the world, and uh, I have gone that shamanistic and in developing my relationship to the Lemvedi mm. and helping my my patients uh for those who are are willing to to look at that side of the world to begin to see how i see the world right on well that's an that's an interesting way to see the world i've uh, never heard of a lot of that because it's just not something i've i've really dabbled in i've not that I don't have an interest in religions and uh, 
different cultures, but I, I guess I just got wrapped up more in the East. <laughs> Well, you know, and, and, and you get these mainstreams and, and to be perfectly honest, uh, I had kind of lived my whole life. Uh, I had heard the stories and, and in my head as a very young child, mm. my great grandmother, uh, immigrated to the United States from Denmark. So mm. when I met her and she spoke to us, you know, she told us these stories and that's what we thought of them were, Oh, grandma's great grandma's telling another story. <laughs> and, and, as when I, I, I took my oath and I was uh, ordained with uh, the Presbyterian church originally, and I still had a hollowness that I just couldn't fill, uh, it, it continued to search and continued to do research, continued to study theology. Hmm. And at about that time, my mother at the time was doing a geo- uh, genealogy project. And she was doing a family and, and she's like, well, you knew great grandma. So you do great grandma's side. And so I started doing it and I, I met a couple of my cousins in Denmark and we spoke at, at length, cooked off all my cell time for that month <laughs> and used up and they, any time minutes. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, um, but what they told me is they began to inform me of the, of the legends. And, and what they said was all those stories that I had heard as a kid uh. weren't stories at all. They were real. Mm. And I was like, what? That doesn't make sense. That can't be. You know? And of course, mind you, at this time, I still had my Christian hat on because right. I was still an <laughs> ordained minister. Yeah. And I'm thinking, What? And so more theology, more study. I met a whole bunch of people. Uh, I did some traveling back to Denmark on a multitude of occasions. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was in a session one day. I had a gentleman uh, who was, uh, he was in a a bad way. And uh, we started talking. We got really involved and really going. Mm -hmm. And then the lightning bolt struck me out of nowhere. I just felt an opening, uh, this massive opening, and it, it it's kind of unexplainable, but it was just a, a lightning bolt struck right through me. Mm-hmm. And for the first time in my spiritual career, if you will, at that point, I felt full. Mm-hmm. I felt full and I knew exactly what I needed to do. I knew exactly who I had to talk to. I knew what I needed to say. I mean, everything just fell into place. Um, and then what was that experience like, like at that moment? Can, can you describe it? It was, it was, it was very, very, uh, very vivid. Um, and if a great way for me to explain it is if, there's a sheet covering a door, mm. a doorway, and the sheet's covering the doorway. You can't see what's on the other side of the doorway. You can't, and, and it's, oh, and it's dark. Okay. Dark everywhere. Mm. But when you push and the sheet gives way, you step into a room. Mm. And if you've ever stepped into a huge room, a huge empty room. Mm. That was what this was like. Mm. Okay. I mean, it was huge, and you could now you could just like feel stepping, its size. Was it st- like stepping out of the darkness into? Uh, was the room like bright? Was it like a, a pretty bright nope. room? No, it was still nope. dark. It, it was still dark, mm. but you could feel the immenseness of the room. Mm. You could feel. You know, and, and you expect it, obviously, or I did anyway, I expected somebody to turn on the lights anytime. time. <laughs> but, and I knew in my brain that if they did turn on the lights, I couldn't see the ends of the room. Mm. Mm. I mean, I knew it was that big. It's a big room. Yeah. It, it was, and it, but it was just a feeling of hugeness. I mean, just openness, stepping out into it's space. Vast. Yeah. I mean, yes, and it was it was very enlightening. And the, the thing that struck me as I stood in this room of, of immenseness, mm. mind you, it was I wasn't really 
concerned with the light or the dark. But at the same time, I felt a fullness in my chest. Like I had taken a big gulp of air and I didn't mind you, but it was a big gulp of air. And I was, you know, 10, not even tensed up, but just full. Mm. And, uh, that, that feeling of being full, you know, and as I snapped out of it and came back to, to the session I was in, um, and we both got quite a surprise and, uh, continued to work and, uh, got him taken care of, went home, um, for the day. And I, I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I don't know what just happened. And, uh, but something happened and I've never lost that feeling in my chest. Oh, wow. I, I mean, that, that just that feeling of being complete, of being full. Um, it's, it stays with me today, even today. And uh, so, but the, the immenseness, I think, to me, represented what I wanted to know, hmm. what I, where I wanted to be. And, uh, and uh, I think to me that, that that experience has meant to me that Odin found me and he ordained me then. Uh, I did not take a blood oath until the following winter because uh, by tradition, we can only take blood up blood oaths after the first moon, oh, uh, uh, tradition? the first full moon after. What I'm sorry. What tradition is this? This is the, that is the Norse. Okay. okay. Just when, when, general when, Norse. When, when can you do that? After the first full moon of the new year. Ah, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. I was, I just, no, no, not trying, at all. trying to get, you know, uh, my handle on exactly, you know, what, what we were talking about. <laughs> Yeah, and so I took a blood oath uh, um, with uh, with my dog, who served as my spirit animal, uh, mm -hmm. as as being the relative of a wolf. And uh, we took a blood oath uh, in the middle of the night, out in about a foot and a half of snow. Um, and uh, uh, I've been I've been an oof, you know, oof Hefnar ever since. And I have felt absolutely compelled to do what I do every day. I feel like every day I get up and uh, the, the minutes I have between sessions, I'm always writing. I'm either writing my shows or I'm writing my, my uh, I am going for a PhD in psychology. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, How far along are you? trying to, um, yeah, the, the story keeps unfolding. Uh, hey, as you know, with more PhDs. Will be more will be revealed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, I've kind of got an outline and I've got the thesis and the hypothesis done. I've got the, the testing mechanisms structured. And so I've begun the survey process um, mm -hmm. where some of, of the study is, you know, the coagulation of data points uh -huh. to kind of support what, because some of mine, obviously, if some of the, the, the thesis is based on for lack of a better phrase, it's, it's based on old wives tales. Um, and what I mean by that is to say that my theory is, is that the spiritual world around us alters our psychology and it alters our psychology, whether we believe it or not is irrelevant. It alters our psychology and it does that in such a way that we as humans interpret much of what is suggested, what is provided to us from the spirits as a sensory input to the brain. Hmm. And so many times, you know, the sensory input, as you know, uh, comes up the brain stem. Uh, it meets, um, uh, the, you know, the lower part of the brain stem, but then it goes into the ponds from the ponds. It goes into the midbrain. And I believe my, my, hypothesis is that the midbrain is where you receive where all humans receive spiritual communication hmm. and the reason i say that is that um just above the midbrain on the brain stem is the um, amygdala, amygdala which is yeah which is where the 
fight or flight is. Yeah. yeah and absolutely. so you can receive the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's, the, that's, the, <laughs> that's the phrase I'm going to use. The heebie-jeebies to a point where it terrifies you out of a room. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I think it's happened to everybody at least once, right? I, I, I yeah, absolutely. My my thesis says, or my mm. hypothesis is that this is a spiritual force providing you with some level of warning, and your body is responding to it. Mm. Your body is responding to it in a way that it knows, and that is, it's a sensory thing that tells it, "Oh God, bad things are about to happen. We're out of here." Now. Mm. We go back in the, the, into the same room. The lights are on now. Mm. There's nothing there. The stories can then be retracted in the brain. But the idea that it was dark, you couldn't see. So you had no other sensory input to what was in that room. And right. you've got this vibe that something evil was in that room. See ya. Right. You're out. And, yeah. and I believe in my heart that that message that you got was not brought to you by your own, your own psychology. Mm. It was brought by an exterior force. Mm. Um, so I have a question. Okay. So answer with keeping your hypothesis in mind, um, children are more apt to be scared in those types of situations than adults, right? We, we can agree on Correct. that probably. Yes. Do you think that maybe over time your ability to receive these signals from spirits um, diminishes? I do. Caveat. Mm -hmm. With the also the idea that you learn to ignore them. Okay. Yeah. Or or, or you begin to your brain begins to process it in a, such a way that it's by the time it reaches the memories, it's kind of discarded as one of those, well, that's a silly thought. Right. That's just a write, silly write thing. It off as, yeah. Yeah. And because you've got other mechanisms that build up, you know, because when, within the brain, the brain is woo wee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but the, <Chaos>. the, the <laughs> brain, <laughs> the brain, I mean, we have our memories, right. And then we have this related layer is what i call it hmm. the late the related layer which then says oh okay well the t that thing is round therefore this other thought over here says round things roll okay so that thing over there rolls and because the related is layer is what does that and i think what happens is you're, with talking, your about spiritual you're talking about a relation of ideas versus a matter of fact right right, right. D separating the data points from related points, right. right? And so I think what happens is your brain gets to a place where it says, um, oh, I just received a spiritual signal. And eh, yeah, no, um, for whatever reason, oh, I don't believe in that. Or, right. um, you know, and again, some of it comes back to pride, ego, um, you know, I'm not going to let anything scare me kind of thing. So you get some pride involved. There's a you, whole bunch of different reasons. Do you think they were t maybe like taught or programmed to ignore our intuition in those kinds of situations? I, I really question the whole concept of intuition. And that's, that's part of what I'm, I'm digging into now is, is figuring out what, from an intuitive perspective, what, what are we figuring out versus what are we being told? Mm -hmm. And so kind of, because it, obviously there's a fine line between those two and, and sometimes those two line up, sometimes they don't. Right. Um, but I think, you know, with intuition, um, is the idea that you're getting at that you can't really have uh, an intuition of the true self because the true self has been subjected to so many different stimuli throughout life that you can't really access it? Well, no, I think there's a, there's a piece that says intuition is a very quick relationship between multiple data points that can 
uh, accumulate or can construct a new data point based on those those all those related points very quickly. Hmm. And what I question, hmm. I think about, is whether what happens if our data points are then supplanted with a, a, a spiritual nudge, we'll say, hmm. just for anything. Does that change our intuition? Does that change the final output of what we think we think we thought of? Hmm. So I, I, I think there's some pieces there that I, I'm, I'm still in the questioning phase right. as to figuring out what exactly is intuition and how can we define it. My, my ultimate thought is, is that we know, I guess. <laughs> okay, I know. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> I know that when we talk about the animal kingdom, we talk about dogs, cats, birds, bears, huh. name it, out there in the wilderness. Huh. They're communicating all the time huh. with each other, um, with the environment, whatever. And the reason I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, have you ever seen a flock of birds? Yes. I don't hear anybody calling cadence. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, left turn now and, and slide the whole V formation the other direction. So they're communicating at a level that we don't understand, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And or they're receiving signaling and they're passing signaling back and forth in such a way that they're all able to move fluidly together as a unit. Right. And so that is a very, uh, 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 very powerful piece of evidence that we are indeed surrounded by. And I think what's happened is if you go all the way back mm. 196,000 years ago, when the anatomical modern human came out of Africa, mm. And, you know, migrated across Asia and up right. Europe. I think part of that evolutionary process, and we know, and this we all do know, is that when those humans uh, before the AMHs came along and found fire, learned to cook their food, mm. found out that cooked food was easier to digest. And all of a sudden we got this other protein called Fox P2 and the Fox P2 essentially grew synapses in the brain at an exponential rate right? to the, a point where it actually brain doubled in size and, over a course right. of like a million years. Yeah. Which, which is well, a it, yeah. It's not even, it's not even that. I mean, you talk about the evolution of the human brain from the Fox P2, that evolution is 196,000 years hmm. to going from, a brain half our size, half the size it is now, to what we have. And then um, during that evolutionary track, I think what happened is there's a split where we begin to split the instinctual thinking, mm -hmm. which is what animals, all animals are, right? They think right. instinctually. Right. Um, and so what happened is instinctually, Animals can, can communicate freely with the spirit world. Hmm. They do it all the time, comfortably. So you think but, this is like a, a trait that we as a, as a, a species has, have just lost? I think we're, we're in the process. We're in the de-evolutionary track. Yes. Yes, I do believe that. Hmm. So, but... All right. So, yeah, so that's, that's kind of where my, my, uh, as you can tell now, um, and you're welcome to go to the website, check it out. Um, and awesome. my thesis yeah. is there, oh, cool. um, and all the, all the information that I've put together so far is still is out there. So you can go out and check that out. And, and what's the, and, what's uh, it's a K. Ulf Hefnar, and that's spelled a K. U L F as in Frank H E D N A R dot com. Cool. 
Awesome. Yeah, and, and, yeah, you can go out and check it out. And, and uh, if your listeners want to join in, uh, there's a survey. <laughs> um, it's an anonymous survey I'm doing for data points that kind of talks about just kind of opening up those religious doors, talking about how religion affects psychology. So Awesome. Right on. Well, hopefully some people uh, will help you out and fill out the survey. Yeah. I know, I, I'll go do it. Why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anything I can well, do to help I, I, I appreciate all the data points because what it, it, it will obviously do is as more data points are gathered, as you know, you, you can then dive into your, your measuring techniques and, mm -hmm. and actually your gauges as to, you know, are your testing mechanisms in place? Are they correct? Are they accurate? So those are the, the all the things that I need to answer, obviously, with, with surveys. And so first one's out. And next one, I think, is due probably at the end of the month. So Awesome. Well, hey, man. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate you taking the time I, talking to me. Absolutely. Thanks again to Dr. Mark Weissman for being on the show. If you'd like to get in touch with him, he can be found at AK Ulfhednar. That's A-K-U-L-F-H-E-D-N-A-R.com. If you enjoyed the show, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And as always, thank you for listening. This has been Dharma Junkie. Namaste.